Amen. Amen. Do you love Jesus this morning? Come on, do you really love him? Amen. Amen. God bless you. What a special day for all of our mothers, and I just want to raise my voice and honor all of our mothers that are here. We love you. Thank you for your love, your sacrifice, your giving. Thank you for rearranging the priorities of your life for us. We are enormously grateful. Um, I recognize today may not be, may be a day of heaviness for some mothers. So I'm just going to pray and believe with you today that I know that some people, their, their mothers are with the Lord today. There may be other mothers that are believing for a restoration of families or believing that a prodigal son or daughter would come home. And I'm just going to believe God that he's able. A few people believe that with me this morning. Our God is able. And I believe that he's going to turn the situation around. Do you, can you just believe in faith with me? That for mothers that are, are believing God for young men and young women to give their hearts to the Lord and surrender that this would be the last Mother's Day. Amen. Amen. This would be the last Mother's Day with a son or daughter that doesn't know the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God can turn it all around, can you? Praise God. I want you to open up in your Bible to Exodus chapter 1. I I don't know exactly where we're headed today, but I, I know this is the text we need to be in. I I felt in my heart to share with you, I think, on one of the greatest mothers of the Old Testament, Jochebed, which is the the mother of Moses. And um, I I believe this is where the Lord wants us, but we got to lay a little bit of foundation in Exodus chapter 1. As you're turning there, um, one of my favorite stories about my wife, you know, a lot of times preachers get accused of stretching stories and You know, the the fish was this big, and we said it was this big. You understand what I'm saying? So the story that I'm about to tell you is going to sound crazy, but I promise you before God in heaven, it happened. One day, my wife was was out, and I was home with all three of the kids, which is always so much fun. It's wonderful. Baby, This was a special day. You know, baby dedication. We dedicated three babies to the Lord, and we're not dedicating any more, so stop asking. I was home with all three of our kids, and um, the two big ones, David and Gigi, at the time, they were six and seven. This is about a year ago. They were six and seven years old, and they were horsing around upstairs, and I could hear them pounding and, you know, jumping all over the place, and, and they were having a great time. And then all of a sudden, I heard this blood-curdling scream. But it, it, they, it was Gigi. She was having fun. She was enjoying herself. But I don't like screaming like that even in fun. So I went to the bottom of the staircase and Sophia was with me. She was two years old at the time. And I looked up and I said, hey, I don't want any screaming like that in my house. And Sophia looked up at me at two years old. I promise you before God, this is true. She said, daddy, it's mommy's house. (laughs) It's mommy's house. I love my wife. I am thankful for the three beautiful children she gave me. What a blessing from the Lord. We, we're blessed, aren't we? Aren't you thankful for your mother and for your wife? Amen? Are the men out there, are you thankful for your wife? I am so thankful. The, the Bible says that when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Christina is greatest, God's greatest mark of favor in my life. And I'll tell you, I'm blessed. But she is God's greatest mark of favor, and I am so thankful for her life. I'm thankful for my mother. God has been so good to us, and I know he's been good to you as well. Amen? Amen. Exodus chapter 1, and uh, we're going to start. Let's start at verse number 6. It said, and Joseph died, all his brothers and all of that generation, but the children of Israel, they were fruitful, they increased abundantly, they multiplied, and they grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was full of them. So the children of, of, of uh, Israel are in Egypt. They went into Egypt as a family of seven, but they were going to leave Egypt very shortly between, scholars believe, between two and four million people. It was a miraculous thing that took place. They began to multiply and they began to grow. And what's interesting about this text is that Joseph, who was their leader in Egypt, died. But even after he died, the the group, the people began to multiply and began to grow. When you look at the text, the the political realm was about to change. Joseph was dead, and then another Pharaoh was going to arise, the Bible said, who didn't know Joseph and didn't know the mighty things that God had done. 
And although things were changing for them, they still were continuing to multiply and to grow. Aren't you thankful this morning that it doesn't matter what happens in the economy? And it doesn't matter what happens in politics. And it doesn't matter who's sitting in the seat of the White House. We are a blessed people. A few people know that this morning. We're a blessed people. And we're not connected. Our source is not our job. Our source is not the government. Our source is not what's happening around us. Our source is the Lord. And even after Joseph had died, the people continued to multiply and to grow. Aren't you glad that God's work doesn't start with a man and it doesn't end with a man? God's work, the Bible says, the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. And I am thankful that even when things began to change, when Joseph died, and they were about to come underneath the burden of slavery, the Bible says that they continue to multiply and they continue to grow anyway. I believe that's the testimony of your life, that it doesn't matter what's happening around you, and it doesn't matter what the circumstances of your life are. We are a blessed people. I said, we're a blessed people. God is our source. His hand is upon our life. And it doesn't matter of the circumstances around us. We are connected to God himself. He is our source. The Bible says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. It doesn't matter what's happening around us, and it doesn't matter the climate. It doesn't matter the political climate. And I know that we're getting ready to go into probably what's going to be the ugliest and bloodiest political season that we have ever seen in our time on this, in, in this country. But I'm not connected to that. I said I'm not connected to that. We have a different king. We have a different kingdom. And it doesn't matter what's happening all around us. We are connected to the vine of Christ Jesus. And we will bear fruit in every season, the Bible says. The Bible says that our, in Psalm 1, our leaves will never wither. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says that even in old age, you'll produce fruit. That you'll be fruitful and that you will multiply. God's got his hand on your life. And I'm not worried about what anybody says. I'm not worried about it, what anybody does. I'm not worried about what's happening around me. I'm not worried what's happening in overseas and wars and rumors of wars. We are connected to the vine of Christ Jesus. And we will continue to multiply. We will continue to grow. We will continue to be blessed no matter what's happening around us. Hallelujah. Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, I have set you on high above all the nations of the earth. Is that where you are this morning? Come on, can you let your faith arise even as we're beginning this? I've set you on high above all the nations of the earth. We are a blessed people. The Bible says that even the enemy may come in in one way, but he'll leave in seven ways. That means he may come in strategically, and he may come in with accuracy, looking to destroy the work of God, looking to slow the work of God down. And he may come in in one way, but God's going to scatter him in seven ways. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And that goes for your house too, that the enemy may come in in one way, but he's going to leave in seven ways. I've set you on high above all the nations of the earth. He said, I've made you to be the head and not the tail. I've made you to be above and not beneath. Aren't you thankful the Bible says in Ephesians that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So it didn't matter that Joseph died. And it didn't matter that the political climate was changing. We are a blessed people, aren't we? And we continue to multiply and grow. If God is for us, who can be against us? Thank you, Lord Jesus. So look what happens. Verse number eight, now arose a new king over Egypt who didn't know Joseph. And he said to the people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest we multiply and it happen, that in the event of war, that they also join our enemies and fight against us and so go and so go up out of the land. So now all of a sudden we recognize that the children of God were multiplying and they were growing and it had offended Pharaoh, bothered him and he didn't like it. They were getting too strong because there was reproduction, there was growth. It was a birthing season. Can I tell you that the enemy will always come during a birthing season? The enemy will come when we are multiplying and growing. I'll prove it to you right here, but I'll also prove it to you when Jesus was born. 
a wicked king by the name of Herod rose up and he said, all of the baby boys that are two years old and younger, kill them. Because the enemy shows up during a birthing season. You look in the book of Acts, as the church was beginning to multiply and the church was beginning to grow, that supernaturally, the Bible says that thousands were added to the church daily. Daily it was happening. And then all of a sudden came the persecution. And all of a sudden came the opposition, both externally and internally. False prophets began to arise and false teachers began to stand. But in the midst of all of that, in the midst of the affliction, in the midst of the opposition, go and read the text. It says the more they, the more they afflicted them, the more they continued to multiply and grow. The more they afflicted them, the more they came to multiply and grow. Why does the enemy come during a birthing season? Because he's looking to stop the work of God in your life. When you're pregnant with something, when you got a vision, when something's happening on the inside of you, when something's happening in a church and God is birthing something and there's expansion and multiplication, the enemy, that's when he comes to do his work. Hallelujah. That's when the enemy will come to try to slow things down and shut things down and quiet the work of God. Do you know when you go and you read in, in Revelation chapter 2, do you see that there are seven, seven churches that John writes through the inspiration of Jesus himself, writes a letter to the seven churches. And they all dealt with different issues, persecution and martyrdom, false teachers, a wicked spirit of Jezebel that looked to manipulate and control leadership and control people. And these things were all pressing in on them. But there was one church by the name of Sardis that the Bible calls the dead church. And when you look and you read what Jesus said to the dead church, there were no false prophets there. There were no false teachers there. There was no spirit of Jezebel there. There was no martyrdom or persecution there. There was no affliction there. And I'll tell you why. Because they were so dead, the devil didn't even bother them. Do you hear me this morning? The church of Sardis had no opposition because they weren't doing anything for the Lord. Isn't it amazing that during a birthing season, that during a season of multiplication, when the kingdom of God is moving forward, when the church is moving forward, when your family is moving forward, all of a sudden that's when the enemy shows up. But I want to tell you something. Look at what the scripture says. Verse number 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and they grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The Bible says this, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. When the enemy comes in against the church, when the enemy comes in against your family, that is the time to stand up and put your feet flat on the ground and stand with faith and stand with boldness and understand that even in a time of opposition, this is a birthing season. God's kingdom is advancing and you and I are going to advance with it. Jesus said, I'm building my church. I'm building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful for what God is doing? And there's no devil in hell that can stop it. There's no opposition that can shut it down. The Bible says that greater is he who lives in you than he who's in the world. Hallelujah. Come on, do you believe that this morning? Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's time for continued expansion. It's time for continued multiplication. When the enemy steps in, the Bible says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the enemy comes against your family and tries to destroy your children and bring strife into your marriage, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for multiplication for greater harvest. We are living in the last hours of time and the enemy is doing everything that he can to shut down and to quiet the church of the Lord Jesus. But that makes me want to shout even louder. It makes me want to stand even stronger. It makes me want to put my feet flat on the ground and sharpen my teeth a little bit because opposition is a sign that you are moving in the right direction. Hallelujah. 
God is working in his church. God is moving in his church. God is confirming his word with signs and wonders and miracles in his church. And I'll tell you, anytime the enemy wants to discourage you, begin to look around you, God will begin to encourage you. He'll begin to lift up your head. Aren't you glad the Bible says that he is the glory and the lifter of our head? That I don't have to be discouraged by what we're seeing around us and the opposition that may come against the church of the Lord Jesus. Lift up your head. He's the glory and the lifter of our head. Hallelujah. Is anybody thankful for Jesus this morning? Anybody thankful for the work of God? No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Pharaoh did his best, but no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against us in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter what the enemy says. We're going from strength to strength and glory to glory and victory to victory. I'm going to keep preaching this until faith arises in your heart. Hallelujah. Your family's not going down. You're going higher. Your family's not going to get torn apart. God's going to bring your children back to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The enemy is defeated and under our feet. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So it goes on. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and all manner of service in the field, and all the service which they had made uh, them serve was with rigor. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. The name of them was Shaphra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife... For the Hebrew women, and see them on the birthing stool. It, and it, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then you shall let him live, let her live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. But they saved the male children. I don't have time to get in this with you today, but there is a time of righteous rebellion. This word sits above every law and every edict of government. And if the time ever comes where you have to make a choice, know that you are on good ground. I would rather stand with Jesus and burn in a fiery furnace. I'd rather stand with the Lord than to be torn apart in the lion's den. I'd rather stand with the Lord than have to come under the judgment of Pharaoh. When there comes a time and a choice in your life, when you have to decide between the kingdom of God and this world, you better stand on the word of God and you better stand like these midwives did. No, we're not gonna kill our babies. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, so they, they disobeyed. It was a righteous rebellion. Why have you done this and saved the male children? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth for the midwives before the midwives come to them. Can I just tell you, look at what the scripture says. The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. Can I just tell you to every mother and every woman of this church, I am so thankful that you're not like the women of this world. You're different. There's a holy virtue that's on the inside of you. You're the fruit of the spirit that's demonstrated in your life. The kindness. You know, I, I, I said it before. I told it to our, our students as I, I love to share with them and just share wisdom out of the word with them. I tell our young women and I tell our young men, look for a young woman that is gentle, gentleness. Let that fruit of the spirit, you want to get into a relationship with a woman, find a young woman with gentleness and kindness in her, in her heart. The Bible says a meek and quiet spirit, which is precious to the Lord. That's the kind of young woman that you go for. That's the kind of women that we have in this church. That's the kind of testimony that our mothers have in this church. The Bible says first, in 1 Peter, he says, don't waste your time. Don't take your time adorning yourself on the outside with braided hair and with earrings and with all these things that we try to produce on the outside. He said, no, look for an inward beauty. Our women are different than the Egyptian women. There's an inner beauty in our women here. 
a meek and quiet spirit, which is precious to the Lord. The Bible goes on to say that's the way the women of old were. That's the way Sarah was. And look how God blessed her. At 90 years old, quickened her mortal body and began to have a child by the name of Isaac. And that child birthed the nation of Israel. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that our women are different. I'm thankful that there's a gentleness in our women. I'm thankful that there's a joy in our women. I'm thankful even in my house when some, from time to time that when dad is a, you know, gets a little bit stirred up from being at work and sometimes gets a little overwhelmed with the schedule that I keep, that there's a woman in the house that is gentle and that is joyful and changes the atmosphere even of my house. Our women aren't like their women. You know, the Bible says, this, there's funny verses, you know, you got to read the Bible. It's very interesting if you actually read it. It says, the, the Bible says, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a woman that lacks discretion. The Bible goes on in Proverbs to say, it's better to live alone on a roof than with a contentious woman. You should see it, you're laughing, but think about that. This was, this was written in the Middle East where the sun would shine brightly. It's better to be alone on a hot burning roof than with a contentious woman. Can I tell you? That's not our women. You know, the guys, you're awfully quiet. That was a good place to say amen and score some points. Our women are different. Our women are different. My wife is different. The women that I serve with in this church, they're different. There's a different spirit in them. The fruit of the spirit is, has been developed and is operating in their lives. And what a joy it is to see the kindness and compassion and the love of God that's been shed abroad in their hearts. And I want to tell you something. I've been serving the Lord all my life, but I am thankful for a gentle and joyful woman that even changes my attitude from time to time. Not coming with her finger in my face, but with an open hand on my cheek. And all of a sudden, everything changes. Can I tell you something? I, I didn't think I was going to get into all this. But you know, I want to tell you something, and I mean this with my heart, and I don't want to speak disparagingly or against anybody or anything, but there's a reason why many men don't want to come home from work at 5 o'clock. There's a reason why. There's a reason why they begin to, men begin to even attach themselves emotionally to somebody else, because men are attracted to honor. And where they are honored, they will stay. Let, let me say that again to you. Where they are honored, they will stay. I can't wait to come home every day. I race to get out of my office because there's an, a woman and an atmosphere in my home, not like the other women of this world, not like the houses of this world. There's peace and joy and contentment that comes into the house. Our women are not like the Egyptian women. Can anybody say amen this morning? Amen. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for all of you mothers. You're not like everybody else. You're different. God's hand is upon you. And the joy and the gentleness of your spirit, it impacts us. And if your husband won't tell you, I'll tell you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Verse number 20, therefore God dealt with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew mighty. And so it was, listen to this, because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them, for them own, for their own. So these were midwives, these are women that didn't have children of their own and may not have had husbands of their own. But I want you to see how God begins to turn the situation around. There is a law in the Bible called the law of impartation. You will become like who you hang around. You will become like who you hang around. The Bible says in Proverbs that if you walk with the wise, you'll become wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. If you hang around bitter people, you're going to become bitter too. If you hang around angry, gossipy people, you're going to start to be angry and gossip too. If you hang around prideful people, you're going to become prideful too. If you hang around people that are apathetic and lazy and don't care about the things of God, then that's going to be the testimony of your life too. I want you to see that God gave an impartation to these midwives. He gave them an impartation to those he was in, they were in proximity to. As they were near these birthing mothers, all of a sudden, God gave them an impartation of what they were hanging around. 
And so these women may have not had husbands, and may they, they may have been buried, barren themselves. But when they stood, and they stood for this next generation, and protected the work of God, and stood for the work of God, and stood for the children, and their proximity to the mothers, the anointing that was on the mothers then came on those midwives. And they began to reproduce. And they began to have children. You know, the Bible says, oh, sing, oh, barren woman. Hallelujah. For more are the children of the barren woman than the desolate. I'm telling you, God can turn around every situation of your life. And even for women that may be believing God for husbands and believing God for children, I know that my God can open up wombs. And I know that God can place the lonely in families. When you get around the anointing, the anointing is going to begin to rub off on you. Hallelujah. As they began to serve these women that were giving birth, it wasn't long before they began to give birth themselves. So don't hang, and let me take you to further now. Don't hang around bitter people because you're going to get bitter. And don't hang around angry people because you're going to get angry. But if you can get around people that have a vision in their spirit, that are giving birth to something in their spirit, that know that God has a plan and God is moving them forward and that there's an anointing on their life, that anointing is going to be transferred and that impartation is going to come to pass in your life. The barren began to sing. And those who had no children began to break forth in having children. Aren't you thankful that God can turn around every situation of life? That God can turn around every boat broken place and every place that is lost and every place that is hopeless. Hallelujah. You know, I, I've been teaching Sophia, our youngest, the, the scripture. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. And you've got to hear her little voice. She begins to profess and say that scripture. Now in him is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. And I was teaching her that verse, but then all of a sudden, like the Holy Spirit and a shot went off in my spirit just over and over again. Now unto him who is able. You know, our God is able. Now unto him who is able. Our God is able to turn around every situation in your life. Our God is able to bring dead things back to life again. Our God is able to make all things brand new. And the, the barren woman may think she's going to be barren forever, but our God is able. Hallelujah. God turns the situation around for his glory. Our God is able. Do you know he's able this morning? Our God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. There's nothing too hard for our God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Bible says, our Lord God, thou made the heavens and the earth by thine great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Hallelujah. Do you know that this morning? Nothing is too difficult for our God. Can you say amen with me? Amen. amen. Chapter 2 now. Or 20, verse 22. So Pharaoh commanded all the people saying, every son who is born, you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. And a man, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, and a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. So then, so the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she, she hid him for three months. I want you to notice something. The Bible says that she conceived a child. But don't forget for a moment what was happening in the land during that time. There was a death order against all the male boy, the boys that were born. But she conceived anyway. I, I just need to put yourself in the text because I would have never thought about this until I became a parent myself. But you have to think about this for a moment. This is before the days of ultrasounds and blood tests and you know what the baby's gender is going to be very early on. This is before all that. A mother who conceived the child underneath this death order for nine months would have waited with bated breath Am I going to have a little boy? And is that little boy going to end up in the Nile? You think about the trauma. You think about what could have been taking place in the heart of a mother and father uh, underneath the edict and the wickedness of Pharaoh that all the baby boys are going to die. Not only carrying that baby, but carrying a burden. What's going to happen next? You know, it would have been perfect wisdom to say, you know what? L let's wait until... Let's wait until Pharaoh relents. Let's wait until Pharaoh lifts his death order. Let's just, let's just give it some time and see what happens. 
Would that not have been wisdom? Let's pause for a moment. Let's put our family plans on hold until Pharaoh relents or until he changes his mind. But we're not people of fear. We are people of faith. And I want you to see a mother here and a father here that despite the wicked order against them, they chose to conceive and to have a child anyway. I have a friend in ministry that said, anytime the enemy tells you not to do something, do it twice. Keep on going and moving forward. The enemy does not dictate the plans of the church. The enemy does not dictate the plans of our family. The enemy does not dictate the plans of our children. We do not march to the drumbeat of this world, of this culture, or to what Satan says. We are part of a different kingdom. We are part of a different king, and we have a different king. And the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. In the natural, in the natural, shut it down. We'll have a baby another time. In the natural, when the king Darius said that there's a decree for 30 days, you can't pray. Let's just pause for 30 days and let's wait this thing out. But Daniel did the same thing that this man, husband and wife did. We're going to have a baby anyway. We're going to pray anyway. We're going to believe anyway. We're going to move forward anyway. It doesn't matter what the enemy is saying, and it doesn't matter what the enemy is doing. We are not connected to the systems of this world. We are connected to Almighty God. Hallelujah. You don't allow the enemy to dictate your life, the choices of your life, how you live your life, how you raise your children. Social media doesn't dictate where you go and how you raise your children and the way that you do it. The people at our job, even our friends and those that are around us, don't dictate how we speak to our wives and how we treat our, our families. We're different. We don't walk by faith. We walk by sight. Don't forget the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. I'll tell you, church, I believe it with all my heart. It is required of us. Even in moments like this, when it seems like there is total opposition from the enemy, that that's when we stand up even stronger and say, no, we're gonna have this baby anyway. If God is for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. If God is for us, who can be against us? You can try to kill our son, but we're going to have the baby anyway. You can try to bring your opposition, but we're going to move forward anyway. You can try to shut us down, but we're going to stand up and we're going to go to higher heights anyway. That's the testimony of the church of Jesus Christ. Is that your testimony today? Hallelujah. So let's go on. It says, so she conceived the woman, or she conceived, the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it in asphalt and pitch, put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done. Now watch this. This is important. I'm going to do this real quick, but there's three arcs in the Bible. You know that there's Noah's ark, there's the ark of the covenant, and then there's Moses' ark. Noah's ark is where we see that we have protection from the wrath of God. When God was pouring out his wrath and judgment on the earth, anybody who was in the ark was saved. In the ark of the covenant, inside of the ark of the covenant is the law, the Ten Commandments. We know that inside, when we are in Christ, that we are protected from the law. The Bible says if you broke one part of the law, you've broken all the law. But in Christ Jesus, he fulfilled the law for us. Is anybody thankful for that? What we could never do, the Bible says, Christ did for us. He fulfilled the law for us. And then thirdly, we have this other ark. This is Moses' ark. And when she put Moses into this ark, it was protection from the hand of the enemy. I want you to see something. First of all, in every case, the Ten Commandments were in the ark. Noah and his family were in the ark. Moses was in the ark. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ. Aren't you thankful that you're in Christ this morning? Our lives, the Bible says, are hidden with Christ in God. That's where we are this morning. We are in Christ Jesus, safe and secure. Praise the Lord. 
But I want you to recognize something, that when this mother put this baby into the ark, she was putting her son it as a type into Christ Jesus and therefore being protected from the hand of the enemy. Let me prove it to you now. She took that baby, she put him in the ark, and she put that, that little ark in the Nile River. I want you to notice something from the previous scriptures. That was the same place where Pharaoh gave the command that in the Nile River, your sons are going to drown. But in that same river, she put that baby in Christ Jesus. And the enemy may be able to kill some other babies, but won't be able to touch yours. That was supposed to be, according to Pharaoh's rule, that was supposed to be a, bla a place of death. But for Moses and for his mother, it became a place of destiny. That little ark, he went in that ark, and the Bible says that that ark went into Pharaoh's house. And Pharaoh's daughter sees the baby, and she draws him out of the water, and she says, I will call you Moses, for I have drawn you out of the water. See this now, that the place where Pharaoh said he's going to drown in the water is now the place where he is drawn out of the water. I know that there is a wicked plan against your children. I know that, the, that the, the public school system and politicians and teachers are trying to pervert the minds of our children, not in universities like they used to do, now as young as elementary school. But I'll tell you, the place where they want them to die you put your baby in Christ Jesus. You raise them in the ways of the world, in the ways of the word. You, hid, you hide them in Christ and you hide them in the word. And where all the other people are drowning in confusion, in sexual immorality, in addiction, these, these little children are being destroyed because of this wicked system. But for you, it's going to be different because your baby's in the ark and there's protection in Christ Jesus. And where everybody else is drowning, yours is going into destiny. Hallelujah. The place where the enemy is, going to, is trying to kill our children is the very place where God is going to raise them up because they are in Christ Jesus. For all the parents that dedicated their children today and all of the parents that have young ones that are raising them, more than anything else, more than anything that you can do, put your baby in the ark of Christ Jesus. Raise them in the ways of the, ways of the, of the Lord. Raise them on the word of God. The enemy wants them to drown in that river, but you put them in the ark and God is going to keep your baby safe and secure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have three children and I'm not going to lose one of them in the river. I have three babies and I am not going to lose one of them to the wicked decrees of Pharaoh. Hallelujah. Parents, you got to pray with faith and lay your hands on your children when they're awake and when they're asleep and declare over their life, you are hidden with Christ in God, that you are seated with heavenly places and no enemy is going to pluck you out of the mighty hand of God. You're going to serve the Lord all of your days, not one day of rebellion in your heart. You're going to serve the Lord. Put your babies in the ark of Christ Jesus. Put them in a place of safety and security. And when the enemy may try to come in and destroy their little lives, they are hidden safely in that ark. Where the others drowned, Moses was brought to destiny. Hallelujah. Gone from drowning in the water, the Bible says, to being drawn out of the water. I'm telling you, parents, you've got to have some faith in your heart this morning. And to know that you know that you know. You know, it's amazing to me. You know, we send our, our kids off to the public school system and they'll be there 35 to 40 hours a week. And parents, I love you enough to tell you this. They'll, they'll be there 35 to 40 hours a week, just this indoctrination in their hearts and in their little minds all day long. And we'll bring them to church as long as it's not raining and they didn't have baseball that morning. Your baby's not in the ark. I love you enough to tell you, your baby's not in the ark. I have children too. And with all the love in my heart, I tell you this morning, if athletics take a priority over God's house, you're not putting your baby in the ark. If family events and gatherings take pre precedence and priority over God's house, you're not putting your baby in the ark. 
You can't send them to school for 40 hours a week and give God an hour, if that, if all the, all the stars align and there's no baseball and there's no family events and it's not raining outside and then I'll take my kid to church. I love you enough to tell you this, you're going to have troubled teenage years. Put them in the ark. Put them in the ark. Put them in the ark. Put them where there's safety and security. The Bible says this, all the children will be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. When you teach your children the word of God, when you get them invested in the house of God, I'm telling you what will happen. You will begin to see the fruit of their lives, even in young age, just begin to be produced. That they're going to carry a testimony, even in your house. That they're going to impact even the atmosphere of your house. That they're going to have an impact on the children in their schools around them, even as young as elementary school. Put your baby in the ark. My children mean too much to me. They mean too much to me for me to send them away and not prioritize the house of God in their life and the word of God in their life. I don't know about you, but my babies aren't going to drown in the Nile. The enemy's not going to have my kids. I'm not going to allow this confusion in their minds, in their sexuality to come into my kids. You put them in the ark. Put them in the ark where they'll be safe and secure. Let me keep on going. It says she took an ark, verse number four, and the sister stood afar off to know what would be done for him. Then the daughter, verse five, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then the sister of Pharaoh's daughter Shall I go and call a nurse? And then the sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, that's Miriam, Moses' older sister, shall I go and call a nurse for you, for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter, did you hear that? The child went and called the child's mother. Hallelujah. Watch what's about to happen. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the child and nurse him for me, and I will give you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. Now watch what happens. She decides that she's going to entrust the Lord with her son. And she puts him in that ark. And that ark goes down the river. And Miriam, the, the older sister, keeps a close watch on that ark. And as the, 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 as the Nile drifts, that little ark, right from the place of death to the place of destiny, right into Pharaoh's house, Pharaoh's daughter draws him out of the water. I'm going to call you Moses. You're not drowned in the water. You are drawn out of the water. I'm going to call you Moses. And then Miriam pipes up, would you like to have a nurse? Would you like to have a wet nurse for that baby? And she goes home and she gets Jochebed. She gets the mother of that child. And then here's my favorite part. That Pharaoh gave a decree for all the baby boys to die. But because there was a mother of faith, because there was a mother who believed God, because there was a mother that stood even against the wickedness of the culture, that she had the baby. She trusted the Lord with her baby. And then God began to turn the whole situation around. As that baby goes into the ark and goes down the Nile, the Bible says that she draws him out of the water. Can I get a wet nurse for you? Can I get somebody to help you nurse the baby? And she goes home and she gets Moses' own mother. And the Bible says that Jochebed, she comes to the house. She begins to feed the baby and nurse the baby. And Pharaoh says, daughter, I'm going to help you. I'm going to pay you for what you're doing. The same wicked government and the same wicked Pharaoh that said your baby's going to die here is now the same Pharaoh that was paying for that baby boy to live. God turned it all around. God turned it all around. Not only was there a decree for him to die, that he began to live. But then because of this woman of great faith, where are the women of great faith this morning? Where are the women of great faith this morning? 
She trusted the Lord with her baby. God turned the whole thing around. And Pharaoh, who wanted to kill the baby, now is paying Jochebed to take care of her own son. Hallelujah. Only our God can do that. Only our God can do that. Now unto him who is able. He turned the whole thing around. Aren't you thankful that he can turn your mourning into dancing? Aren't you thankful that he can give you the oil of gladness for mourning? Hallelujah. He'll give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. God can turn the whole thing around. And I want to tell you this morning to every mother that's here, everything that the enemy meant for evil, God is going to turn it around for your good. Just like he did for Jochebed. He's going to do it for you. What the enemy meant for evil, God meant it for good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He works all things together for our good. To them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Let me say that to you again. He works all things together. Can I tell you what that means? Even when things are look like they're going wrong, they're still going right. When it looks like your baby's going to drown in the river, you put your faith in Christ Jesus. And even when it looks like things are going wrong, God turns it around and he makes everything right. Hallelujah. That's why I'm praying and believing with some mothers this, this morning that may have a heavy heart, that may be praying over a child that doesn't know the Lord, or maybe some mothers that are, that, um, that are believing God for a, a spouse that isn't serving the Lord. And there's a heaviness in your heart. I'm believing that what God did for Jochebed, God's going to do it for you. That he's going to turn around all of the situation of your life and turn your mourning into dancing. Hallelujah. 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 The Bible says, sing, O barren woman. Sing. Even, even when it doesn't look like things are going right, just begin to break out in singing. Just begin to break out in dancing. Who cares what Pharaoh says? Who cares what the edict and the law that he brings and the plan of the enemy to destroy your life? Just begin to break forth in singing and dancing. God's going to turn it all around for your glory. God's going to turn it all around for his glory. He's going to take the situations of your life and completely reverse them for the honor and glory of Christ Jesus. Come on, if you believe that with me, why don't you stand to your feet and give a great big shout to the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. He's turning my morning into dancing. He's turning my sorrow into joy. He's giving me a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He's working all things together for my good. Hallelujah. He's working all things together for your good. God turns it all around this morning for you. Only our God can do that. You can't entrust your life to anything else. Only our Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can turn around the situations of your life. I'll tell you, even as Pharaoh was against this family, even as Pharaoh tried to destroy the people of God, there is a wicked devil in hell that wants to destroy your life. The Bible says that it's the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There is a thief, the devil, who wants to destroy your life, to tear your family apart, to put you underneath bondage, even as Pharaoh did. But I'll tell you, there's a great God in heaven. The Bible says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you would have life and have it more abundantly. I don't care what the enemy may be doing against your life. I tell you this morning, according to the word of God, God will turn it all around this morning. I don't care what the enemy, what the devil has sent to try to kill you. God turns it all around this morning in Jesus' name. God didn't come to destroy your life. The Bible says in John 3, 17, for I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but through it, it might be saved. You know, if you don't know it in the simplest way, the devil is against you and God is for you. The devil wants to destroy your life, but God said, I want you to have life and to have it more abundantly. Only our Jesus can do that forgive us of our sin, to forgive us of our past, to turn our life around, to make us a new creation in Christ Jesus, where old things pass away and behold, all things become brand new. Only Jesus can do that. And the only thing it takes is exactly what Jacobed had, just a little bit of faith, 
I'm going to trust in the Lord. We are not saved by religious obligations or rituals. We are not saved by being perfect people. We are saved by faith. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It's to believe. It's to believe. You're not saved any other way but by Christ Jesus. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It just takes faith. Just as it took a little bit of faith for Jochebed to trust the Lord with her son, it just takes a little bit of faith to trust the Lord with your life. And it's an act of faith that says, Lord, not my will. I know that I can't be the captain of this ship. I have to turn this over to you.